set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won. And they must be won and used for the progress of all people. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. John F. Kennedy, 35th President of the United States. In 1961, he set a goal for the nation, that by the end of the decade, we would land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. That goal is now about to be achieved. 30 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust. July 20th, 1969. These voices are coming from a lunar module as it descends to the moon in the frozen silence of space almost a quarter million miles from Earth. Now, at exactly 3.18 p.m. Central Daylight Earth Time, the man module touches down. Instantly comes the message of which mankind has dreamed throughout the ages. In the words of Neil Armstrong, the eagle has landed. And as he steps down, the first man to touch foot to the moon, he declares, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And answering for the people of Earth, Richard Nixon, 37th President of the United States of America. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. For one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this earth are truly one. This is a moment that many regard as second only to the creation itself, that ranks alongside man's discovery of the uses of fire, the invention of the wheel, the plow, the voyages of Marco Polo and Columbus, the fission of the atom, all turning points in time. For now, our world and our history are no longer locked into a single planet. Now, our world is all space. Our history is as wide and deep and broad as all the universe. To put our flag on the moon, has taken the work of two and a half million persons over a period of 11 years and has cost nearly $25 billion from the day our nation first decided to launch a man in space. And it has also cost the lives of eight extraordinarily skilled and courageous astronauts who knew always what they faced. There's always a possibility that uh, uh, you can have a catastrophic failure, of course, this can happen on any fight. It can happen on the, on the last one as well as the first one. So uh, you just plan as best you can to take care of uh, all of these eventualities. And uh, you get a well-trained crew and you go fly. That was the voice of Gus Grissom, Lieutenant Colonel Virgil I. Grissom, U.S. Air Force, speaking one month before he and two fellow astronauts burned to death in a ground test of the first manned Apollo spacecraft on January 27, 1967 powerful little bear of a man. He had the determined courage that fights down fear. For by his own admission, Gus Grissom was often afraid, but never let that stop him from trying to reach the moon. Grissom's was but one of the many voices, tense or confident, somber or cheerful, that made history on the path to the moon. At the very first press conference where American astronauts were introduced to the world, John Glenn joked, well, My wife made a remark the other day, I've been out of this world for a long time, I might as well go on out there. <laughs> 
from Deke Slayton, whose destiny it became to send scores of other men into space, but be forbidden to go there himself. I'd uh, give my left arm to be the first man in space. And there have been the many other voices that called across space, as stage by stage, through projects Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, our path was open to the moon. Alan Shepard. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Scott Carpenter. The sun sets are most spectacular. After the sun has set, the earth is black. The first band uh, close to the earth is red. The next is yellow. The next is blue. The next is green. And the next is... Wally Shira. The lightning looks like a big blob rather than a jagged streak that we're used to seeing when earthbound. Uh, it just looks like a big, uh, almost like a... Gordon Cooper. Father, thank you for the success we have had flying this flight. Thank you for the privilege of being able to be in this position, to be in this wondrous place, seeing all these many startling, wondrous things. Ed White. I've come about the space there. I'm coming back down now. I'm under my own control. It really looks funny out there. You see my glove out there, Jim. The flight director says get back in. Well, this is Jim. Uh, what, got any message for us? Jimmy Porter, get back in. Okay. Pete Conrad. Yeah, we're looking straight down over Australia now. We have a Terminator at our right window. We have the whole northern part of the uh, world. Yeah. Uh, one with it. Utterly fantastic. Frank Borman. The moon is a uh, different thing to each one of us. I think that each one of uh, each one uh, carries his own impressions of what of what he's seen today. I know my own impression is that it's a a vast, lonely, forbidding type existence or expanse of nothing. A medley of American voices. The Hoosier twang of Indiana. The even level of prairie speech. The soft accent of the South. The precise articulation of New England. All speaking plain American. But all becoming a little hushed. A little awed as ever they approach nearer and nearer the moon. Queen of the heavens. The lover's star. Night lamp in the sky, the sweet surprise of heaven. From the moment the first man looked upward in the night, the moon has been an object of wonder to all the races of the earth. The Greeks and Romans worshipped the moon as a goddess, under such sacred names as Phoebe, Cynthia, Artemis, Diana. Fortune tellers studied the moon to predict the future. Farmers planted their crops according to the phases of the moon. It was long believed to be a cause of lunacy. It has been the subject of countless thousands of poems in all languages, and almost as many American pop songs. For ages, the moon has been regarded as a symbol of chastity, yet was thought to be able to set lovers on fire. From the beginning of time, people on Earth have fancied they could see a man in the moon. Now, suddenly, there is one. Question, how old is the moon? The Bible says that God made the moon on the fourth day of creation. Scientists guess that it's about four or five billion years old. Question, how did it come into existence? Some think it was thrown into space. Others believe it rolled together like a vast snowball from bits and pieces of cosmic debris called meteorites. But this we know for certain that as long as mankind has existed, we've reached out for the moon like a child for an enchanting ball. And the moon has ever reached back toward us, trying to pull us toward it with a force that we can see in the rising tides of all the rivers and oceans of the earth. So it would seem that from the beginning, the moon and we were made for each other. But the moment it's proposed that we send a man to them, objections come from all sides. Many ask, of what possible use is it? What is the use of a newborn child? 
This was the answer of Benjamin Franklin, discoverer of electricity, when asked in his own time, what is the use of this invention? For ages, man has envied the bird its wings. Icarus, in the Greek fable, flew from the earth with feathered wings attached to him by wax. But the wax melted near the sun, and he fell to his death. There is a legend that five centuries ago, Wan Hu, a Chinese Mandarin, discovered the principle of reactive power that drives such rockets as Atlas, Titan, and Saturn V in our own time. Wan Hu worked out a plan to fly to the moon sitting on a chair between two enormous kites that would be powered by 47 slow-burning sky rockets. And that's all a booster really is. A super rocket with its motor pointed earthward. As the fuel burns, gases shoot downward and the booster lifts upward with exactly the same force. Newton's third law, that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now back to Wan Hu. Since he was never again seen on Earth, maybe he did make it to the moon. Flight into space, even to the moon, was the dream also of a long-nosed French swordsman and poet called Cyrano de Bergerac in the 1600s and of Voltaire, Edgar Allan Poe, Jules Verne, Edward Everett Hale. But until the turn of this century, rockets remain pretty earthbound. They were used as toys that brought oohs and ahs at fireworks displays, as distress signals, as a way to throw a life-saving line from shore to ship, and as a kind of artillery called the Congreve rocket. And with Congreves, for instance, the British assaulted Fort McHenry in the War of 1812. Turn of the century. The gas buggy has only about started to chase the horse from the streets. But already, Three great rocket pioneers are working on the feasibility of sending a man into space. There is an awesome prophecy in the nationalities of these three men. For they represent the three great powers that within half a century will be competing in the vast, fierce race into space. In 1899, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky a Russian high school teacher, even more obscure than the town where he lives, declares in an article that will not find a publisher till years later, the earth is the cradle of the mind, but one cannot live forever in a cradle. To set foot on the soil of the asteroids, to lift by hand a rock from the moon, from the moment of using rocket devices, a great new era will begin. Four years later, in 1903, Tsiolkovsky finally achieves a hearing with publication of his book, The Exploration of Planetary Space with Reactive Equipment. Soon after, an American high school student, Robert Goddard, declares in his graduation address, it is difficult to say what is impossible, for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. By 1960, Goddard has become a physics teacher and has carried experiments to the point of firing homemade solid fuel rockets. He writes an article entitled, A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitude, which the Smithsonian Institution publishes in late 1919. Today I will speak about the proposal for an electric spaceship that doesn't use and that is the actual voice of the third great space pioneer, Professor Hermann Oberth, speaking before a group of distinguished scientists and engineers. In a 1923 pamphlet, The Rocket into Interplanetary Space, Oberth makes some wild predictions that someday it will be possible to orbit a large manned rocket around the Earth. 
the passengers will leave it in a smaller landing rocket, visit another planet, and go home the same way. A Russian, an American, a German, all working with pencil and paper to solve the problems of flight to the moon. The Russian schoolteacher builds his country's first wind tunnel. Also, he studies the possibility of liquid fuels, solves the theoretical problems of how to escape and re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And even under the repressions of the czarist and communist regimes, government funds are granted for the publication of 58 books by him. Goddard, in his landmark paper, has speculated about using the implications of Newton's third law action and reaction to send a rocket to the moon. The country laughs and calls him the moon man. The New York Times comments. That Professor Goddard with his chair in Clark College and the countenancing of the Smithsonian Institution does not know the relation of action to reaction and of the need to have something better than a vacuum against which to react. To say that would be absurd. Of course, he only seems to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in high schools. But there are such things as intentional. The 1920s, the jazz age, the era of wonderful nonsense. From 1919 to 1925, the American professor, now working with liquid fuel motors, explores stabilization apparatus, the multi-stage rocket, self-cooling motors, pumps for the liquid fuel, practical landing devices, and quietly patents many of these ideas. But by 1924, Russia also has set up the Central Bureau for the study of the problems of rockets. And in Germany, Professor Oberth envisions an instrument-carrying rocket that is a prediction of the spaceships of the future. He develops a rocket motor called the egg that will help lead the way to the power plants of all the large rockets of today. 1926, Auburn, Massachusetts. The world pays little or no attention to Robert Goddard's history-making launch of the first liquid fuel rocket. As his widow recalls. It was March 16th, a cold day, but fortunately no wind. My husband had an igniter at the head of the rocket and Mr. Sachs had a blowtorch on a stick and applied the blowtorch to start the, the rocket. The rocket itself was lightweight aluminum, bit almost like a toy, and even now uh, people marvel at the quality of the parts in it. This first flight took a little long to get started, but when the jet came, it was brilliantly white and beautiful and smokeless. And uh, it made exactly the same kind of noise that you hear now on a small scale. It uh, went up, I think, probably 50 or 60 feet and then angled off and uh, landed in a cabbage patch with very old cabbages in it in March. Mrs. Goddard later wrote that the rocket actually reached an altitude of 41 feet, was in the air for two and a half seconds, averaging 60 miles per hour, and landed 184 feet from the launch frame. As always, she served as her husband's official photographer. A year later, in 1927, a handful of dreamers in Germany formed the Society for Space Travel. And a few years later, a similar handful of American rocket devotees, meeting in a New York apartment above a speakeasy, give themselves the imposing name of the American Interplanetary Society. And two members, G. Edward Pendray and his wife, go to observe the German rocket tests. Willie Ley uh, took us out to a suburb of Berlin where the uh, German Rocket Society had what they called a proving ground. And now there they had well, a somewhat crude but effective device for testing uh, liquid fuel rocket motors. And there we saw the first liquid fuel rocket motor we had ever seen in operation. We were so filled with enthusiasm by this site and the simplicity of it, and the obvious power of it, uh, that uh, when Mrs. Pender and I got back to the United States, we made a 
for what was apparently a very impressive report to the society. And the society immediately decided to go into an experimental program of its own. And about a dozen of us began to design a rocket. The first of our rockets... Was Not only is there American interest, but the German Space Society also attracts the attention of Walter Dornberger, then a young German Army Ordnance Captain with a PhD in mechanical engineering. He will head his country's rocket effort from 1930 up to the end of World War II, by then Major General Dornberger. We in the Army, at that time, were listening and reading about all this rocket endeavor, and uh, we came together and thought maybe here is a way where we can uh, circumvent the conditions of the Treaty of Versailles, which prevented Germany from developing any new weapons. They had prohibited all kinds of heavy weapons, destructive weapons, but they had forgotten the rocket, and they had forgotten the glider. In these two areas we concentrated. I made round trips to all of these little inventors, and support, we supported them with money, more than they got ever from civilian sources, but it was a failure. We had to do it ourselves. And um, as I finally convinced my boss, uh, the chief of the German Board of Ordnance, General Becker, he gave me the means to do it. And they reserved a small location in the proving ground near Berlin, in Kummersdorf, where we set up our facilities. And um, here we finally uh, put together some of the inventors who realized that they couldn't make any headway, and we hired them as employees, engineers, and we finally were in the year of 1932, a group of six or eight people. Among them was von Braun. Von Braun at that time was a student at the University in Zurich, Switzerland, but I hired him and he came to us and joined us. We were not interested in the six decimal behind the comma of a flight path to Mars or Venus. We were not interested in the accuracy or anything like that. We wanted first to prove what could be done with that thing, and that was a power plant. But the 1930s are a time of depression. In America, the government worries about how to give people bread, not power plants for rockets. Although the Guggenheim family does make funds available for further testing, to Goddard and to the California Institute of Technology. The name of the American Interplanetary Society, which causes skepticism in the whole universe, is changed to the more modest American Rocket Society. Nevertheless, Pendray, seeking help from Washington, runs into roadblocks. During this uh, entire period from 1930 onward until the Second World War, uh, there were numerous attempts to interest uh, the NACA, the Army and the Navy, and later the Air Force in uh, developing rockets. Uh, their reaction generally to any approach was, well, if you say rockets or will do these wonderful things, build us a rocket that will and bring it to us and then we'll talk contract. Uh, this made a course an impasse because what we needed was money in order to do the development and what they wanted was the development completed in order to uh, uh, just to evaluate it also he meets a grave scientific objection from the director of flight research at the national advisory committee for aeronautics so i talked to uh, dr lewis at the time he spent a whole afternoon proving to me that nothing could fly faster than the speed of sound he covered a blackboard with mathematics proving something that I knew wasn't true, but his mathematics was more profound than mine. So uh, uh, we got nowhere. We presently saw, after a year or so, that if anything was to be done, we'd have to do it ourselves. The first day of September, 1939, speaking at the Berlin Sports Palace, Adolf Hitler launches a war game unlike anything the world has ever known. World War II. Poland is overrun in a matter of days. The following spring, France is defeated in six weeks, and England reels under the greatest air attacks in history. 
By 1941, Russia, its back to the wall, fights with masses of men and conventional weapons, except for the Katyusha, an artillery rocket, the first practical result of her highly advanced rocket theories. The United States military put their main scientific thrust into the Manhattan Project to create the atomic bomb. The long-standing NACA is limited by law almost entirely to airplane research. However, at a wartime staff meeting, even when rockets are mentioned, a top executive ends the discussion with the historic declaration, you can have the Buck Rogers job. In Germany, the rocket scientists, now established at a secret army experimental station at Peenemünde on the Baltic, have their priorities canceled. Dornberger pleads for military funds and gets permission from the chief of the German army to grab from frontline troops 8,000 engineers and technicians who had been drafted for combat duty. Hitler disregards the war potential of rockets and so dooms himself to defeat, as Dr. Dornberger tells in this historic account. And we, against the wish of Hitler, we proceeded with our work in Pinamente for years. And um, when it was finally finished, and we had the first launching, successful launchings, uh, Professor Speer, the ammunition minister, went to Hitler's headquarters and told him that this thing seemed to be ready now. And he wanted more money and top priority. And Hitler told him, no, yesterday you sent me some schedule, what you want to talk about. And I dreamed about last night, and I dreamed that this weapon would never reach England. And therefore, it's no use to give any money. I can trust my thinking. Late in the day, Hitler, realizing his mistake, makes one of the few apologies of his life to General Dornberger. And in July 1943, orders crash production of that supersonic rocket missile, the A-4. It's the second of a series of airborne weapons that propaganda minister Goebbels calls Vergeltungswaffen, or revenge weapons to bombard London in reprisal for Allied air raids on Germany. The world comes to know it as the V-2. By the war's end, 3,745 V-2s will have been fired on England and Belgium from mobile launch pads in Holland. But damage is relatively light compared to that caused by bombing planes and V-1 buzz bombs. Fortunately for the world, the V-2 was never given enough development time to become the miracle weapon Hitler sought. By early 1945, the end is in sight. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, four-time president of the United States, makes a 14,000-mile round trip to Yalta in Russia to plan the coming peace with Stalin and Churchill. On March 1st, exhausted but optimistic, 
He reports to a joint session of Congress. <clears throat> the three most powerful nations have agreed that the political and economic problems of any area liberated from Nazi conquest are a joint responsibility of all three governments. They will join together to help the people of any liberated area solve their own problems through firmly established democratic processes. A month later, Franklin D. Roosevelt is dead. For a moment, Hitler takes this as an omen of German victory, then takes his life. V.E. Day, victory in Europe. We've agreed, in FDR's words, to join with Russia in restoring war-torn Europe. But behind the scenes, it's a case of each man for himself. Both have been eyeing Germany's rocket program. Weeks before Germany surrendered, a special U.S. task force, under the code name Project Overcast, directed by a brilliant treasure hunter, Colonel Holger Tofta, races into Germany behind the retreating Wehrmacht. The treasure Colonel Toftoy seeks? All available pieces of the immense German rocket program. The remaining V-2s, the scientific blueprints, the highly trained men who were the world's best existing pool of practical rocket experts. The task force races over the zone scheduled to be occupied by the Russian army in a matter of days under the Yalta Agreement. One group heads for Nordhausen in the Hartz Mountains, famous for its canaries. There in a cave 200 feet deep, V2s had been assembled by slave labor at the rate of 600 a month. What we found there is now recalled by James Hamill, then a young army major in charge of special mission V2. The word two huge tunnels running through a mountain and as one walked in one could see that uh, actually they were production lines with feeder lines coming in from either side as the missile was being assembled and pushed out the front door to accomplish the job one had to get in there and get those v2s out just as fast as one could. Now, there was no point in saying where was this zone or where was that zone or where was another zone. One had his orders. He had his objective, and nothing stood in the way of it. Our job was to acquire sufficient rolling stock to move V-2s back to the port at Antwerp, where we were met with not the greatest perception of loading American ships up with what looked like parts of bombers and aircraft that have been shot down because if you've ever seen a V-2 stripped down it doesn't look much like a weapon. Meanwhile, another member of Toftoy's team, Army Major Robert Staver, by interrogating German engineers has learned that the vital plans and documents for making V-2s have been hidden in a mine shaft elsewhere in the Hartz Mountains. Taking six trucks to Norton, Major Staver recovers 14 tons of the precious documents. Simultaneously, a young German scientist, much esteemed by his boss, General Dornberger, is faced with a difficult decision. He is Dr. Werner von Braun. In early 1945, with the Allied troops closing in on Germany from all sides, uh, we uh, were confronted with a great number of conflicting directives as to what uh, we and Pinemann were supposed to do. Some of these directives said uh, stay put and uh, uh, help fight the Russian army off that was moving in from the east. Other directives said uh, move to central Germany if you can and continue your experimental work. Well, I called my confidence together in a secret location and just confronted them with uh, these various alternatives uh, that the directives offered us. And we took a unanimous vote to try to move to central Germany and to surrender to the United States forces. Russian brain hunters attached to the Soviet 19th Army 
have also been racing to Benamunde, only to find that they've been beaten to the punch. That scene is described in this historic interview with Professor G.A. Tokati, at that time one of Russia's leading rocket experts. But when the units of the 19th Army reached Benamunde, the technological disappointment was greater than the pride of seeing the red flag flying over the ruins. All had been dismantled, loaded on special vehicles and trains, and taken away to America. Projects, research materials, test equipment, rockets, and finished products, the most valuable means of production, almost all scientists and engineers, and even the furniture, had managed to escape from Pienemunde. Here we are, the chief engineer of the Soviet Air Forces said, the flag of our victory flies over Berlin, but the most deadly weapons of the fallen enemy have walked over to the Americans. Nevertheless, the Russians do not give up. As Professor Takati recalls his talk with one of the few remaining German scientists, when Tokhari himself was chief rocket scientist of the Soviet government in Germany. I remember saying to Dr. Bad, we won the war and lost the V2, but we are going to win the jet rocket race quite independently of you, the Germans. But how, he asked. I will tell you how, was my reply. We will marry our own theories and projects with your production experience and that will be good enough. The Soviet science team makes a public announcement that to help restore the German economy, the rocket factory will reopen at once and that returning workers will receive not only good wages, but food and lodging. With Germany near famine, thousands of technicians, workers, and secondary engineers swarm back to the Nordhausen factory. Suddenly, a year later, the Soviet secret police rounds them up in the middle of the night together with their families, and ships them to Russia, where they're quizzed endlessly about production technique. But they're not allowed to see anything of Russia's rocket program. Dr. Dornberg, despite urgent pleas from the U.S. Army, is held prisoner by the British two and a half years. They plan to hang him as a stand-in for a dead SS general who actually directed the V-2 firing on London. Instead, they finally free Dornberg, who comes to the United States to work first for the Air Force, and later as consultant to Bell Aircraft. Von Braun, and ultimately a corps of 120 rocket experts, under a one-year contract to the Army, are brought to America, and with them the captured V-2s and documents. Under the direction of Colonel Toftoy, who led our rocket hunt in Germany, the V-2s are assembled for firing at White Sands, New Mexico, a desert more like the moon than the Baltic pine forests where the V-2s were born. The American test equipment is as sparse, as barren almost, as the desert landscape itself. In the late 40s, words like space and rocket are rarely heard. Instead, America talks about the Marshall Plan to restore Europe and keep Russia from gobbling up even more whole nations. We talk about the new look and clothes from Paris, about a new Broadway hit called A Streetcar Named Desire, starring a discovery named Marlon Brando, about the Berlin Airlift, and Harry Truman's surprise defeat of Tom Dewey at odds of 25 to 1. In the belief that we alone have the big bomb, the big bombers, and the big production capability, we bring the boys home and dissolve most of our immense military establishment. We help create the United Nations and tell ourselves there will be no more wars. Our major rocket effort has gone into an experimental plane, the X-1. In 1947, as the X-1 breaks the sound barrier, a new phrase comes into the language, sonic boom like a knock on the door of the future. He spent a whole afternoon proving to me that nothing could fly faster than the speed of sound. He covered a blackboard. Unheard, 
and unseen by the public. U.S. scientists work to perfect another miracle, a deadly wonder of the world, the H-bomb. What about rockets, ballistic missiles? What about the head start we got by capturing most of Germany's rocket program? During that post-war period, the Army, with V-2s and its own new WAC corporal, and the Navy, with Araby and Viking, have made short scientific probes of the upper air and sent a few reluctant mice and monkeys on short rides aloft. Some Air Force leaders have been urging the creation of an ICBM, a missile that eventually would be named Atlas and be capable of racing 6,300 miles. But our A-bomb weighs too much for the missile to carry. Suddenly, the Air Force's budget is cut to favor bombing planes. The Atlas is shelved. For the next four years, there will be no work on an ICBM. How contrary to the circumstances that made it possible for Germany to create its V-2. We got the money and we did the job. June 25th, 1950. 60,000 North Koreans invade the Republic of South Korea spearheaded by a hundred Russian tanks. At once, President Truman orders General Douglas MacArthur to the aid of South Korea. And shortly thereafter, tells the American public... On Sunday, June 25th, communist forces attacked the Republic of Korea. The attack upon Korea was an outright breach of the peace and a violation of the Charter of the United Nations. We can't know it yet. But we're in for a bitter three-year war. One month later, the Army, even with its limited budget, manages to push ahead. It ties a whack corporal on top of one of the remaining V-2s. July 24th, 1950. We launch this bundle as our first major two-stage missile to go from the sands of Cape Canaveral. Washington shifts back and forth in its missile plans. The Army is ordered to develop a 500-mile surface-to-surface missile. Then the range is cut to 200 miles. But from this will emerge finally the Redstone booster that nine years later will send Alan Shepard, our first astronaut, into space. Long-range missiles will eventually be assigned to General Schriever and his Air Force group, who will take Atlas off the shelf and start working on it anew. This is the United Nations. The United States Ambassador, Mr. Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr., has just arrived with the official truce communication, which he will present to Mr. Doug Hammarskjöld, Secretary General of the United Nations. Mr. Lodge. Your Excellency, I have a note for you, which I shall read and then hand to you. Excellency, I have the honor to inform you that an armistice agreement has been entered into between the United Nations Command and the commanders of the Communist forces in Korea that is, the Korean People's Army and the Chinese People's Volunteers. The agreement was signed for the United Nations... And on August 20th, 1953, a month after the Korean War ends, a redstone with a warhead is test-fired secretly as a weapon. It flies only 8,000 yards down the Atlantic Missile Range to land in the sea. But this test is considered partially satisfactory. Like us, Russia already has an A-bomb and an H-bomb. But also, they are engaged in a secret project that will stun the world. Here again is a first-hand account by Professor Takati. This V-2 is not what we went. Belinkov, then still Stalin's number two, said to us in 1947, the V-2 remains a blind, short-range, primitive weapon. Who do you think can we frighten with it? Poland, Turkey? Our potential enemy is thousands of kilometers away. We must work on the development of long-range rockets. Some 24 hours later, I was at a meeting in Stalin's office in the Kremlin. Present were Stalin, Molotov, Voroshilov, Zhdanov, Mikoyan, Beria, Polinkov, Nikolai Alexeyevich Vaznesensky. 
Colonel General Serov, Belia's deputy, and myself as speaker. As a scientist, I was interested in scientific exploration and technological improvement. But when an almighty ruler whose brutality caused us so much suffering twists your thoughts towards intercontinental bombers capable of reaching New York and Los Angeles, Washington, Chicago, you have to think also about the other chaps intercontinental monsters capable of reaching your own Moscow and Sverdlovsk Kiev and Baku. When you talk about Sputniks, but the almighty ruler reacts by talking in terms of putting the president of a mighty world power in a straight jacket and calls him that noisy little shopkeeper, you have to pinch yourself to find out whether it is a nasty dream or a reality. Thus, the Russians proceed to build the biggest rocket they can. Our thinking is otherwise. A U.S. advisory committee, headed by the brilliant mathematician John von Neumann, pictures that our own H-bomb will eventually be a relatively smaller and lighter package. As a result, we plan in terms of much less powerful missiles. By starting ahead of us and over-calculating their needs, the Soviet Union gets the jump on us into space. While the Russians pursue their single-minded course, we continue with many programs. We hear a chaos of opinions. Jupiter or Thor is perfect. We need Atlas for our long distance stuff. The Titan will be even better. They shouldn't have canceled Navajo. Wait till you see our submarines with Polaris. In the midst of these often conflicting military programs, a great world scientific event is announced. The International Geophysical Year, 1957, for study of the Earth and its atmosphere. As our contribution, Washington plans to place satellites in orbit around the Earth that will collect scientific information. Our best existing launch vehicle is the Jupiter C, a three-stage outgrowth of Redstone. But the Jupiter is military hardware, and Washington fears this might offend the world scientific community. So instead, it chooses a new, untried research vehicle, a package to be made largely by the team responsible for the Viking and the Araby rockets to launch the satellite under the name Project Vanguard. Meanwhile... October 4th, 1957. A faint, baby-like bleat, transmitted by radio from 200 miles out in space, signals to the world the birth of a new age. As a result of intensive work by research institutes and designing bureaus, the first artificial Earth satellite in the world has now been created. Unhampered by the inhibitions which have kept us from a military launch vehicle, the Russians have launched Sputnik atop their ICBM. November 3rd, 1957. Thirty days after Sputnik 1, Russia throws a second traveling companion into space. This time, it carries a half-ton payload into orbit at 18,000 miles an hour. There's also a passenger aboard, a dog, Laika, the first living creature to orbit the Earth. All over the world, people step outside their houses and their huts to glimpse the Russian flash in the sky. And we can't even send up a basketball. How could it happen? We're supposed to be the richest nation in the world, right? Right. The smartest, right. the most powerful. Yeah, right again. So how come the Russians made monkeys out of us? To a nation shamed and outraged, President Dwight D. Eisenhower offers an explanation. Well, let's remember this. The value of that satellite around the Earth, going around the Earth is still problematical. And you must remember from 1945 when the uh, Russians captured all of the German scientists in Pinamundi, which was their great... Um, uh, laboratory and experimental grounds for the production of the uh, ballistic missiles they used in World War II, they have centered their attention on the ballistic missile. Russia got all the Germans? Professor Takati offers another view. Having defected to England, 
he delivers a paper in which he quotes an infuriated statement by dictator Joseph Stalin, made in his presence just after World War II. Quote, we defeated the Nazi armies. We occupied Berlin and Peenemünde, but the Americans got the rocket engineers. What could be more revolting and more inexcusable? How and why was this allowed to happen? Unquote. Minus 25 seconds. Two, five. December 6th, 1957. Minus 20. A modest test of the three-stage rocket of Project Vanguard has long been planned for this date. A White House spokesman announces incorrectly that we are planning to orbit our instrument package. The world press sees this as America's answer to Sputnik. Reporters and TV crews swarm to the area to give the event full coverage. Our supposed answer to Sputnik is an inglorious flop. The first stage explodes, and the rest collapses in the wet sand in full TV view. It has become unmistakable, finally, that Russia, as she herself has long claimed, has the jump on us in the space race. But, in fact, we've not been exactly left standing at the starting line. For more than a year, Werner von Braun and his rocket crew, working now under U.S. Army General Medeiros, as they once worked under Wehrmacht General Dornberger, have had their Jupiter C ready to go. That same military rocket we held back for fear of offending the scientific world. Twenty. 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 January 31st, 1958. Washington finally permits the Army agency to make available the Jupiter C. 84 days after the launch of Sputnik 2, we reply to Moscow. Atop this rocket, we fire into orbit Explorer 1, a 31-pound package of instruments developed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory the first U.S. Earth satellite. A decade later, it is still in orbit. As a consolation for its smallness compared to Sputnik, Explorer 1 sends back to Earth precious scientific discoveries about the nature of space. In the judgment of Dr. Von Braun, the launch of uh, Explorer 1, our answer to Sputnik, was a far cry from the much larger Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2. Uh, we succeeded nevertheless, even with our very first Explorer 1 flight, to make a major discovery. This discovery was a belt of trapped electromagnetic radiation surrounding the Earth. Tim Van Allen had speculated that such a belt might exist, but it was actually through the flight of Explorer 1 that the existence of the belt was verified, and it is only very proper that this belt now bears Jim Van Allen's name. Now the race is on in earnest, the race to the moon. It's a contest that has been in the making since the turn of the century, but with scratch teams only, and few spectators. Now, each side has thrown in the cream of its talent, now the stadium is packed. All the world is watching. The stakes are enormous. Statesmen will pretend from time to time that only a friendly scientific competition is involved. Not necessarily. For at stake now are such matters as political power, military might, and world prestige. Russia, a dictatorship, can dispense with much of the discussion and delay that are the price of democracy. America, till now, has been bogged down by committee. Now, finally, it frees itself and its powers for a vast new surge into space. And all the world is watching.